There is the point. Here is the point. Here is the point. Chop a ball in the low. Put it down on the other side. Chop it down. This is the annual reading of the script. Here is the point. Here is the point. I went back and I looked. What did I really see? I'm thinking about my sight and whether whether this is quite authentic. Welcome, listener, to Socratic Smarts. Thank you very much for clicking on this logo, clicking on this podcast. You know, there's so many podcasts to choose from. How do you know what to listen to? You know, I empathize. I'm a big podcast listener. And it seems like every, you know, wog and their dog, as we say here in uh, Australia, uh, has a podcast and there and, and has a, you know, a bedroom set up and is, you know, thinks that everyone wants to hear their opinion on stuff. And that's exactly what's happening here. So um, if you're still here, if you're still going to listen to the show after that caveat there, my favorite part of every podcast I listen to is the caveat. So the show has is, is already hit its highlight there, I think. So um, no, as you can tell, I'm not a professional uh, listener and I, that needs to be highlighted at the outset. But I am an undergraduate student and I am majoring in philosophy. And I have been exposed to a lot of texts that I feel, um, I feel like one great opportunity about, you know, today's university experience is that if you are doing something in the arts realm, you get pretty much exposed to lots of interesting texts, whether you agree with them or not, they might make you think something uh, a little more. And for me, it's been philosophy. It's been the study of, I think, reason and, and how that gets embodied at the university level. But I think also... Uh, philosophy is about how do we live good lives? How do we live moral lives and fruitful lives? And, and, and you know, what are the things that we are going to be thinking about uh, and appreciating the most when we're about to leave, when we're about to, to die? You know, I think philosophy is, Socrates would put it as the philosophers, is an act of training for death because you're, you're trying to value what's most important and so that you can die with dignity. And so... These are some deep ideas that we hope to get into. And I also want to say at this point, like, I feel like a lot of us also have people in our lives that for whatever reason, um, you know, they didn't get exposed to these texts and they may be, they maybe understand fragments of ideas, but if they just went back and just sort of got exposed to, um, you know, um, just going back straight to the primary text and anyone can do just do this today with the internet, just Google, uh, you know, PDF of any ancient text and bam it's there it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing and with that said listener um view me as a messenger view me as a deliverer of this knowledge because i certainly uh don't have any credentials necessarily and i want to make that clear so i'm going to mostly approach this with the entertainment approach uh but also i do deeply I am deeply interested in this stuff and I'm not going to try and, you know, I'm not going to lie. That's not the point of the show at all. Um, but I am trying to be artistic about the whole thing. But that's, oh, that's, God, that's so boring. Let's get on with it. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about some Thomas Nagel essays in the second part, because as I said, we're going to rely on the real philosophers for the rich analytic deep stuff. Um, but for now, before we get to the brilliant Thomas Nagel, we're going to be talking about um, this guy. I don't know if you heard of him. It's your boy Socrates. Now, you might not have heard that name before. Maybe you've heard it like a movie or, a, you know, a, a, some sort of book you might have read. He, he tends to come up. Um, but if you've never heard the name, let, let, let us just approach it as if you'd never heard of this guy. He did exist. Uh, there's good evidence to suggest that historically this is a real person uh, who walked who walked among us. He was a fellow human, fellow member of the species, so shout out. And he spent his life um, trying to do science, I guess you would say, in that era, in that in Athens. Uh, you know, this is around 400 BC. And... What he comes to realize later in life is that he thinks that there's more of a rich richness in searching for 
questions that we now consider probably more morally moral philosophy more morally relevant so he wants to answer things like what is justice what is virtue what is blah 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 all that stuff and that's the the rich stuff we're going to get into later but let's just stick with the guy for now because the reason why the guy is so interesting is because he is uh, there's just so many layers to why uh he's so relevant not, not only in how literature is played out because you could almost say he's the archetype of the ultimate hero who sacrifices himself very nobly but then on another level you have uh people who criticize uh you know a lot of very critical philosophers and people just in general will will kind of read it and i don't blame anyone for getting this sort of impact from him but you can read socrates and think that he's sort of being pompous or unnecessarily combative or he just wants to prove his point and show how smart he is and and sort of have his ego come out but let's just like focus on who he was and kind of how we should think about his personality as a as a member in the platonic dialogues and and plato just so we get this very clear uh, plato embodies socrates so socrates in the texts that we look at for philosophy in Plato's complete work. Socrates is a character, but there's good reasons to suggest with his earlier works, um, which is to say the early stuff Plato wrote, it's more historically accurate because it's, uh, it's, it's written by other students of Socrates. So you have Xenophon and other people as well who sort of um, fit, so the trial, which we'll get to, the, the apology is, is written by multiple people and it's coincided. But let's get into some of the personality stuff. He says, so actually this is from the Republic, just to make that clear. And he's arguing with Thrasymachus, Thrasymachus, about the nature of justice. And Socrates has just made a bunch of points. And we're hearing this from the first person perspective, Uh, sort of blends in and out, but we'll just make that clear as we go. Quote, Thrasymachus's agreement to all these points did not come as easily as I have described, but had to be dragged from him with difficulty and with a great deal of sweat, for it was a hot day. <laughs> Poor Socrates. And I saw something that I'd never seen before. Thrasymachus blushing. Ooh. So when we had agreement that justice was goodness and knowledge and injustice their opposites, I said, Well, we have settled that point, Thrasymachus. But you will remember that we also said injustice was strength. I remember well enough, he replied, but I don't accept your last arguments and have more to say about them. Yet, if I were to say it, I know you would accuse me of making speeches. Uh, And so we'll just end quote there. So you get this feeling that Socrates really likes provoking people, even when he's sort of out argued them he likes to lay it on so so he doesn't just sort of say okay well that was all good and just shake hands um we we battled out verbally and with rhetoric and let's just say we both you know are equally no he's not like that at all he actually argues with people and if he doesn't find their arguments compelling he actually thinks he's he's wiser he's smarter and there's a way in which we want we want to explore that that isn't as egotistical and as superficial as that may initially sound. If you've never gone into Socrates, you might hear that and think, oh, well, he's just kind of a, you know, a bit of a, as we say in Australia, a wanker. He's a bit of a wanker. I believe the Brits say that too. So, you know, respect. But you just get this feeling that, you know, you could come off as a bit of a, a, a guy that you don't want to be friends with. And that's fair enough. But you've got to keep in mind who he was and what he looked like, what what kind of citizen was he in the Athenian society. Yes, he did go around and provoke people and poke them, uh, but also he did this to people in power. He didn't just necessarily um, do this to people on the streets. He, he was trying to prove a point, which is to say sometimes the people in power don't assume to know things that they don't know. And so someone like Thrasymachus there might have assumed as a, as a soldier, as someone who had fought in many battles, he knew what justice was because he had been inflicting it throughout all of his battles. And there's no way a soldier like him couldn't know, you know, all about justice and virtue and, and what courage is, especially on the battlefield. And Socrates says to him, look, you can't tell me what it is. And you say you know what it is, so I just I just can't take that. I can't assume that. And so here's the kicker for Socrates. I know that I don't know what justice is. 
you think you do know. The difference is I have harvested my ignorance for a unit or something of, uh, if you want to call it like a, like a, for a kind of measurement of knowledge, a, a pixel of knowledge. I have used ignorance to now transform that into a piece of knowledge that I now have that you don't have. And for that reason, I'm wiser. Okay, to get into that point a little deeper, here is a real philosopher, A.C. Grayling, The History of Philosophy. He says, quote, and this is the method of doubt, the method of inquiry, which we're going to talk a little more about. But at least the wrong or inadequate definitions have been exposed, and something has been learned along the way, namely that one is ignorant about the true nature of X, and X in this case is justice, whatever this happens to be, and that, therefore, one needs to think about it more. So on this understanding of exposing one's ignorance what Socrates is doing here. There's an idea that ignorance is the fundamental evil at the root of why we behave immorally. That's kind of what Socrates is getting at. And so let's go back to Grayling here for a second. Quote, Vice is ignorance, and ignorance makes vice possible. This means that the good life is the life examined and chosen, the considered life, Indeed, he said, the unconsidered life is not worth living. That's Grayling quoting Socrates. Quote within a quote. Ooh. A considered life is a life based on knowledge of right and wrong. This is why Socrates claimed, nobody ever does a bad thing knowingly or deliberately. To do a bad thing is harmful to oneself, and no one ever harms himself knowingly or by choice. End quote. So that's kind of a, a quick summary of his thoughts and quick, you know, approach to how he wants to argue his approach. He's trying to get truth over, you might say, mere rhetoric and mere persuasion. He's trying to get to the essence of what's what we're talking about. If we're talking about justice, what are we really talking about? What, what can we find in all cases of things which we might call just? What is the essential variable that we can point to to say that's why it's just? That is what makes it just. Is it because we want to help someone? Is it because we're not afraid to inflict, um, you know, war upon our enemies? What is the just thing? If we if we get more clear about what justice is and expose our ignorance about what it isn't, we get wiser. This is the heart of Socratic philosophy. And this is his approach. And this is why you can kind of see it from a less egotistical perspective. Maybe this is noble. Maybe this could be seen from a perspective of, hey, this is just a guy, very, very old, about to die, who's just poking people and doesn't mind being a thorn in people's backside when it comes to arguments. Here is uh, Stephen Law in The Great Philosophers describing what he looks like. Socrates uh, looked like, quote, a rotund, ugly fellow. Socrates enjoyed engaging anyone and everyone in philosophical debate. His commitment to philosophy meant that other matters, including personal hygiene, invariably took second place. He was often dirty and barefoot and had very few possessions. End quote. And so you get this sense that he's sort of a uh, unkempt, like hippie sort of guy, just sort of, you know, sitting on the outskirts of a, a town meeting, just sort of shouting out heckles and just sort of disrupting things. Um, and he even self-describes himself as a gadfly. And if a gad, gadfly is a, is a fly that flies around the horse's anus because it's a very smelly thing for them and they enjoy <laughs> and they enjoy that. So he even, he even doesn't even mind that he is, uh, could be conceived of as a filthy kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, here's another one by A.C. Grayling in The History of Philosophy. He describes uh, how Socrates' appearance as such, quote, He was famously ugly, with bulging eyes, a big snub nose, and thick lips, a burly frame, an indifference to dress and personal cleanliness. And he had a strange habit of standing in trance for entire days, lost in thought, end quote. And... You know, he's very ugly, sort of on the outskirts of society. He's an outcast in a kind of way. But then you, you hear that. He stands in trance for entire days and you think, what's going on there? Grayling continues, he did not seek public honors or position, though he fought with notable courage alongside his fellows in the wars. He therefore stood out, an anomaly, an eccentric. 
all the more so for incessantly asking questions and confronting his interlocutors when they tried to answer them. One such, Mino, in the dialogue named for him, after several attempts at a definition of virtue have been refuted by Socrates, he says to him, You know, you are like a stingray. You have numbed my lips and tongue. I don't know what to say. To which Socrates replies, and this is where, again, you might get the the ego elite Socrates talking down to the, you know, just irrational peasants. He says, good. Now that you know that you don't know what you're talking about, we can begin to make progress. (laughs) And you can have this kind of condescending, end quote, uh, this condescending guy and i and i understand that but let's get into why there's a kind of wisdom to what socrates is uh is doing there's a kind of there's a kind of inner commitment to what he's doing that is almost spiritual almost religious that is somewhat neglected when i look at the the philosophical uh, interest in in the stories sometimes because ultimately these are stories even though we ground all of our you know, Western science and and logic and politics in the ancient Greek stories. They are just stories at the end of the day. And the more we look at them from different angles, particularly as we learn more about the human condition, thanks to our new psychology and, you know, revelations in psychology. And and so that's a, a very interesting endeavor, what Socrates was up to. And we're going to explore it from a lot of different perspectives. So stay tuned for that. Imagine tomorrow the police knock on your door and say, hey, come with us, say goodbye to your family, say goodbye to your kids, and do whatever stuff you need to do, you're coming with us, we're taking you to court to stand trial. What would you do? How would you react? Would you be afraid? What if they told you that if this trial doesn't go in your favor, if you are found guilty by a jury of your peers by citizens in the community, if they deem that whatever charge that we're going to throw at you is a valid one and we make you guilty, we can fine you, we can maybe banish you, we can exile you from the community. What would you be feeling if you were told this? And perhaps the worst punishment, what if you were told that you come with us and if we deem you guilty, we're going to kill you, we're going to put you to death. Well, this is exactly the situation that Socrates is in. And given our first discussion there about the type of person he was, I can imagine uh, your reaction probably was different from his, which is to be quite contemptuous of the claim and to walk into the court of Athens with the jury of 501 fellow Athenian men to judge him because... Guess what, they were... Sorry, guys, people were sexist back in those days. We didn't have the the moral fortune of uh, common sense ethics as we thankfully do today, but only men were allowed to sit in that courtroom and judge Socrates. And you might be wondering what the charge was. The charge that was brought to Socrates was that he was denying the gods and corrupting the youth. This sort of a one-two punch... Corrupting the youth in the sense that uh, he is basically, for people like Plato, he's telling them to, you know, stand up for yourself and use logic and reason to question those around you, that kind of thing. That's uh, supposedly corrupting them. And to deny the gods, this is a very confusing charge. That, but even Socrates says at the beginning of his trial, this is a very confusing charge. Um, and the charges are put to him by, you might say, an aristocratic kind of group of young up-and-coming political people um primarily a character called Miletus 
who are trying to really undermine Socrates and his in basically his teachings, which is that it is totally acceptable to question all of those people in authority. Um, and it's particularly important to expose their ignorance of things. You know, that if you're, if you're or even in any sort of political circumstance, you don't want your citizens questioning, questioning you on things that are potentially politically hazardous for you to talk about. And so Socrates walks into this courtroom um, and we find out before in the text, which is called the Euthyphro, that he's sort of pondering, um, you know, how he's going to approach it and what he's going to do. And he walks in and he says, look, I am not a lawyer. I'm not a rhetorician. I'm not a sophist. I don't know how to speak in these formal ways. So I'm just going to do philosophy insofar as I know how to do it. And I'm just going to speak to you, my fellow Athenians. And he says, uh, quote, Concentrate your attention on whether what I say is just or not, for the excellence of a judge lies in this, as that of the speaker lies in telling the truth. End quote. So he's kind of telling the jury people, look, I'm going to respect your integrity enough to not lie. And he even says at another point that he doesn't, you know, he's not going to grovel and bring in his kids and his wife and start to you know get some pity party going he's telling the jury look according to my own beliefs i'm not supposed to be here i don't think this is a real charge i think this is you know complete i think this is a complete sham and i'm just going to explain why i think that in however way however manner i can and he's not going to pretend or try to unnecessarily make his speech sound more eloquent uh, just for the sake of convincing people. And this is at a time where rhetoric and, you know, arguments that do have that colorful sort of language to it is very, uh, they're very popular. There's a lot, there's even the idea that if you can just convince someone of something, that's the equivalent of, you know, giving someone an, the truth. And we know that today you could convince someone of a whole number of things that aren't true. And we know just due to the nature of the internet and how people sort of source out their own beliefs it's very easy to convince yourself of something that isn't true just and just by virtue of finding evidence you know there are flat earthers in on this planet that is flat <laughs> for god's sake <laughs> but so socrates tells them that i'm going to respect your integrity i'm going to respect your ability to reason and to you know follow what i say rationally and it's this kind of attitude that Socrates has, even when his life is on the line, he's prepared to not be incoherent, not be irrational, and not be unnecessarily drawn to perhaps ignorance in a way that he is telling others. He's basically lecturing others not to. And this gets to one of the core things going on with the apology. And the apology... I think one way of seeing it from this angle is, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to put everything on the line for? What are you willing to, or rather in the, this case of Socrates, what belief are you willing to hold on to? And if a mob or an institution or any sort of collection of people came up to you in a threatening manner and said, believe this or say you did this or else you know, X will happen, you'll get a fine, you'll get exiled, you'll get death, we don't even, we, we, won't, we won't even tell you your punishment yet, we're just going to say, if you, if you don't submit to what we want, if you don't say, Socrates, that you were corrupting the youth, and that you were, you know, being a bit cheeky, being a bit of a gadfly, you cheeky bugger, we're going to do something horrible, because we haven't even determined the punishment yet, and so Socrates says, look, okay, that's fine, let me just philosophize, and the outcome will be as it will. But what Socrates is not willing to do is to say, is to lie, essentially, is to speak ignorantly and say he was corrupting the youth knowingly or that he is knowingly d denying the gods. He's very careful to say, I don't think I've done this. If I leave this courtroom today, I will continue to live exactly how I have been. So don't expect me to change. And... I don't think what I do is in violation of any of these things or any of these laws. And I think quite clearly what he's doing isn't in violation of any of the laws and he hasn't done anything legally wrong. And to have the 
audacity, you might say. This gets back to the maybe the entitled Socrates who talks down to people. But to have the audacity to walk into a courtroom and say, no, I'm not going... To, even with all of this social power, social influence on top of me, raining down from these more privileged elite people who are essentially using the democratic uh, court system for their own sinister motives. And later on, uh, Miletus and his fellow prosecutors do actually either get exiled or killed, I believe. But Socrates is really honest in this trial. He makes no attempt to sort of use legal or flowerly language. He says, quote, and this is in reference to the experience he had questioning people in power. He says, quote, I tried to show him that he thought himself wise but that he was not. As a result, he came to dislike me, and so did many of the bystanders. So I withdrew and thought to myself, hmm, I am wiser than this man. It is likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but he thinks he knows something when he does not. Whereas I do not know, neither do I think I know, so I am likely to be wiser to this small extent, that I do not think I know what I do not know. He goes on to say, After I approached another man, one of those thought to be wiser than he, and I thought the same thing, and I so came to be disliked by both and by many others. End quote. He explains to the jury from then that he goes on systematically and he keeps trying to talk about people in power and, and really ask, do they know what justice is? Do they know what the goodness is? Do, know, do, do they, Are they living lives that we'd expect the people who claim to be the most virtuous and most, you know, morally, these are supposed to be the people in power that, that are, have, polit- at least that's what they're saying with all their rhetoric. He's trying to question their rhetoric and say, is there anything of substance behind it? The way a poet describes, for instance, the beauty and wonder of nature, Socrates questions the poets and says, well, what do you really consider beauty to be? And then once Socrates thinks that he's demonstrated that through counterexamples and through contradictions and reductio ad absurdums, he thinks he demonstrates the fact that they don't know something or the fact that the rhetorician is using flowerly language to disguise the, a lack of a real message. So you might ask, why does Socrates have this rigid rule sort of logic for himself where he doesn't like, he doesn't want to basically debase himself to the Athenian public and uh, admit that he did do something wrong. He doesn't, why, what, like you might be asking to yourself, I think, which is a perfectly valid question. Why doesn't he just say, okay, I'm sorry, whatever, just give me the punishment. I'll move on. I'll get on with it. I have many wealthy friends to pay a fine for me. Don't worry. Why doesn't he just do that? Why doesn't he just show contrition and get on with it? And he tells this story about um, the Oracle of Delphi. And the Oracle of Delphi was supposed to be some message, uh, messenger from Apollo, the god Apollo. And the Oracle of Delphi told a friend of Socrates that no one was wiser than him. And when the friend delivered this message to Socrates, he was very confused. He didn't really understand it because he didn't think himself wise at all. And this is when he goes on this journey to question people. And this is where the famous, the unexamined life is not worth living. At least Socrates knows the areas of knowledge that he actually has. Whereas people who don't examine things are just sort of mindlessly... Um, falling prey to vices, to evil notions of using other people as a means to an end, or just not seeing clearly what's in their interest, and that's what's causing them to do uh, things which aren't in the interest of themselves or the people around them. And it's this kind of, like, almost religious sense of, uh, I don't know, like, faith is a tricky word, but it's this, but it's like, I don't know how to describe it, he has such a commitment to this message from the gods that it that it is a kind of faith that Socrates has in the message not with it not not in himself he doesn't really put much stock in himself but he thinks well that can't be wrong and he also talks about this inner sort of voice that he's had his li- his whole life and that he lives in accordance with this voice and to admit that he did something wrong to show contrition and to submit himself to the idea that he is guilty of these crimes is to disobey that inner voice. And that inner voice is what he considers responsible for his living uh, a good life, an examined life. And so it seems to go in conflict of what 
he really feels is just and true. And this gets to the heart again of what the apology can really be looked at. If you look at it as an idea about what is, what would you be willing to die for, really? What would you be willing to say, no, look, I'm not going to just debase myself, especially when we consider some of the most central features of totalitarian society. I believe Douglas Murray said this in um, a few interviews. Douglas Murray, a very famous uh, author from the UK, very good writer, definitely recommend checking him out. He said that one of the central features of totalitarian regimes really relates to the idea that you can't say certain things and to even suggest something especially in the public sphere you know that the leader isn't some divine great uh person sent from god or or that you know there isn't something you might say um special about like let's just look at north korea or any sort of uh totalitarian regime throughout history if it was the soviet union you know it, it was you know that vladimir lenin is a great leader and you know you become deified right and especially in the north korea example I mean, yes, many, you might say, you might summarize that as saying that's just a lot of people brainwashed and, you know, just on sort of spell. And that's true to an extent. But a lot of people don't believe that Kim Jong-il and his whole family are some sort of divine beings, but they can't say that. You can't say that publicly without fear of not only you being killed, but your family being tortured and all sorts of horrible things. And so... The idea of the apology can can be boiled down to from this angle, when you look at it from this perspective of what, what is Socrates prepared to die for? He is not willing to allow the state, allow the Athenian aristocracy to essentially um, coerce him into not doing philosophy anymore, because this is what he thinks philosophy is. It's not just a matter of a lot of philosophy today gets bogged down in analytic discussions, but Socrates really wants to live a good life. And so he wants to question those people in power who claim to be living good lives when all they seem to be doing is, you know, sort of bathing in their own wealth and social status and, and sort of living lives that are contemptuous from the point of view of a lot of the citizens who live in on farms or in, in some sort of impoverished condition or certainly at a lower level of status and class than the uh, aristocrats of Athens. Okay, so let's go back to Socrates for a second. Quote, because of this occupation, and this occupation here is philosophy for him, because of this occupation, I do not have the leisure to engage in public affairs to any extent, nor indeed look after my own. But I live in great poverty because of my service to the God. Furthermore, the young men who follow me around of their own free will, those who have most leisure, the sons of the very rich, take pleasure in me hearing people questioned. They themselves often imitate me and try to question others. I think they find an abundance of men who believe they have some knowledge, but know little or nothing. The result is those whom they question are angry, and not with themselves, but with me." End quote. And so you can kind of see how Socrates sees the situation. He is getting unfairly accused of these things, and he is explaining to the Athenian jury, look, I've done nothing wrong. If what you're expecting me to do is to come and grovel and to show that I, I oh, I'm so sorry, I, I won't do it anymore. I'm just going to, you know, quietly go away. Socrates decides, no, I'm going to accept whatever punishment you want to give me, because if you choose a punishment that is, you know, de the death penalty or something, he he's basically saying that is your failure. Or at least if we want to take a more meta analysis of the text, we might be saying that Plato, this is kind of Plato's contention, it's that Socrates isn't the one who's committing the moral failure here, it's the Athenian people. And... As we close off this segment and we close off this story, so what happens is Socrates obviously ends up being killed by the Athenians because they deem him guilty of his crimes. Let's just go through a few more quotes before we wrap it up and move on to Nagel. There's a few sections in the trial where he's really uh, showing how much he doesn't regard death as a moral evil in and of itself. And this connects to the Nagel segment, because in the Nagel segment, we're going to be talking about an essay he wrote on death in Mortal Questions. So think about how Socrates thinks and views death here. Quote, To fear death, gentlemen, 
It is no other than to think oneself wise when one is not, to think one knows what one does not. No one knows whether death may not be the greatest of all blessings for a man, yet men fear it as if they knew that it is the greatest of evils. Even if you acquitted me now and did not believe Anitus, one of the other accusers, who said to you that either I should not have been brought here in the first place, or now that I am here, you cannot avoid executing me. For if I should be acquitted, your sons would practice the teachings of Socrates and all be thoroughly corrupted. If you said to me in this regard, Socrates, we do not believe Anitus now. We acquit you, but only on the condition that you spend no more time on this investigation and do not practice philosophy. And if you are caught doing so, you will die. If... As I say, you were to acquit me on those terms, I would say to you, men of Athens, I am grateful, and I am your friend, but I will obey the god rather than you, and as long as I draw breath and am able, I shall not cease to practice philosophy, to exhort you in, in my usual way to point out to any one of you whom I happen to meet. Good sir. You are an Athenian, a citizen of the greatest city, with the greatest reputation for both wisdom and power. Are you not ashamed of your eagerness to possess as much wealth, reputation, and honours as possible, while you do not care for nor give thought to wisdom or truth or the best possible state of your soul? End quote. And as we move on to the next segment, we're going to be talking about, again, Thomas Nagel on death. Stay tuned. There really isn't anything radically wrong with being sick or with dying. Who said you're supposed to survive? Who gave you the idea that it's a gas to go on and on and on? Welcome back to Socratic Smarts. If death is the unequivocal and permanent end of our existence, the question arises whether it is a bad thing to die. End quote. That, dear listener, is the opening sentence of the essay on death we'll be looking at in the final segment by the brilliant philosopher Thomas Nagel in his collection of essays entitled Mortal Questions. Check it out. This is the first essay. It's called Death. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, straight to the point. And we're going to use it to sort of look back on what we just talked about with Socrates and his attitude here towards death. So Socrates clearly has a attitude towards dying that he'd much prefer to die than stop doing philosophy. That's kind of radical, isn't it? Because the first question we're trying to unpack in this episode is what would you be willing to die for? Let's say someone put a gun to your head you're standing across from your best friend and someone said, kill your best friend or I'm going to kill you. Right? That might be a bit difficult. That might be, that might cause us to, to question whether or not we value living so much that we would be willing to do some evil to someone we love or inflict suffering on someone we love just for the sake of letting our lives continue. Let's make it less dramatic. What if it was a stranger? What if it was a stranger and you said, kill the stranger and you can keep on living, but you can, you can forget about it. No one's going to know. And, you know, after you leave this room, you go on with your life. You have to do this or we're going to kill you. Does that change the variable? Does that sort of, you know, if it was an algebraic equation, does that sort of uh, move the X over and even it out in some sort of way for you? I don't know. It's interesting. But Socrates isn't even taking it this far. I mean, he's what Socrates is saying is there's a gun to my head about a certain belief. Stop philosophizing. Stop being a nuisance in our society. You know, go be an old man somewhere and just be just, you know, we'll exile you. Just just go away. Um, he's saying, no, I have a right to do this in my city, in this city. I have just a right to do do this and be here just as just as much as anyone else, just as much as you, Miletus. And he is prepared to die for this belief. And that's very 
I don't know. That's very strangely inspiring, but I can also see the perspective that it's sort of wasteful. Like maybe he's dying for just something a bit silly. But the other question we want to ask here, and this is where Thomas Nagel is going to swoop in and help us with his brilliant uh, essay. Is death in, in and of itself, in essence, intrinsically, is death a bad thing? And that's where Thomas Nagel starts. And he doesn't actually think that death is a bad thing in and of itself, which is to say the actual state of being dead, Thomas Nagel does not think is somehow morally evil. This is because the state of being dead is something that's almost incomprehensible to us. We don't really know what that would mean. I'm remembering Watts has a line that says something like, uh, when you die, you won't have to put up with everlasting non-existence. So it's not as if you're just going to be, you know, <laughs> staring into a, a gray stone wall, sitting in a room for all eternity and just sort of being bored for, uh, for all of human existence. But Thomas Nagel points out the difference here. He says, quote, If death is an evil, it is the loss of life rather than the state of being dead or non-existent or unconscious that is objectionable, end quote. So he really thinks that it's not the state of deadness that is bad here. So everyone's going to die. It's just the matter of fact. But it's the actual deprivation of life. It's the future lifetime that we could potentially have if we weren't going to die. And so in this way, we can think of a 20-year-old person having more of a pool of lifetime. If we thought of it as a resource, a person in their 20s has more potential lifetime in their pool than someone in their 90s or their hundreds, if they're ever so lucky to make it that far that person has less future lifetime, and so therefore when they die, it seems to be less morally bad. And we sort of intuit this as well. When, when a 20-year-old is in some horrible accident or gets some sort of spontaneous, I don't know, brain aneurysm where they suddenly just are gone, that seems far more tragic than uh, someone who is then in their 90s or, you know, in their hospital bed sort of surrounded by loved ones and is sort of going out the typical way where they have time to say goodbye. And that seems like it's all sort of, you know, wrapping up. It doesn't seem as sudden or as tragic because that person doesn't have as much lifetime ahead of them. But this is where Nagel is very uh, tricky because he basically points out that, well, look, human beings didn't live this long forever. Like we used to die far earlier than we do today. Thanks to medicine, we're able to live much longer. So just imagine a future where we continue to live longer or we continue to live, you know, we continue to expand the lifespan of human existence such that it could be 120, 130. Maybe we just, through technology or through some medical innovation, we're able to live longer. Nagel thinks that, well, now all of a sudden, there is something quite tragic about dying at 80 or dying at 90 because you could have had, you know, more time. And if you can have more time, why not have more time? So this is an interesting thought experiment. How much time would be enough time? Is there a time where you sort of tick off for yourself mentally? Is it like 200 years where you sort of think, OK, that's probably about enough. I'll wrap it up now and, you know, see you later. Uh, I'll go out with a bang. Like, it seems kind of strange, but but it's an interesting experiment to play with yourself and sort of figure out, like, what, what kind of, how many years would you want? Because Nagel points out in the second essay in this collection called The Absurd, that if you lived forever, this wouldn't really help you in terms of feeling complete with respect to your life circumstances. You wouldn't feel just satisfied if I said, okay, look, let's just take death out of the equation. You're going to live forever. You have all the time in the world, all the lifetime at your feet to do whatever you want to do, whatever you need to do, whatever you feel is compelling you and causing you anxiety. You can do it. You've got all the time in the world. Does that fix your problem? It seems as if death really should enter into the equation at some point, but the idea that we have the power to draw the line or we could sort of check out at some point, we can live 300, 400 years and say, okay, well, time to, I think I've had enough, time to jump on another, another ride and that seems very interesting, doesn't it? And just the idea that Nagel points out here with this conception of death as being a deprivation of future lifetime, this idea kind of makes it clear that maybe there is no way in which death is a moral good. So we could say maybe there is a sense in which someone who dies at 90 
has less of a moral evil to die with than someone in their 20s who was uh, younger. It's more, it's more tragic. It's more morally bad for them to die. But maybe it's still bad for the person who's an IT who's, who's dying. Maybe still death there is a something we'd want to remove if the potential lifetime could be increased. But the problem with this argument is that, as we just pointed out, we could sort of expand that forever. And it would seem as if you wouldn't want to live forever. Just if we, if we made your potential lifetime infinity, then this seems to kind of make the concept of death death uh, almost irrelevant and that seems to be quite foreign to all life forms on this planet um, for that matter maybe we maybe there's some immortal being somewhere else we don't know about I mean for <laughs> there could be but for this planet for this galaxy we do die life forms tend to you know emerge and pass away and so if we live forever if we had potential lifespan time to just be unlimited, It seems as if that wouldn't fix our problem here. So Nagel actually points this out again. He says, quote, If the normal lifespan were a thousand years, death at 80 would be a tragedy. As things are, it may be just a more widespread tragedy. If there is no limit to the amount of life that it would be good to have, then it may be that a bad end is in store for us all. End quote. And so Nagel kind of concludes on a somber note there because he's sort of saying that like look maybe there is no way to think of death as being a good thing no matter how much we want to rationalize about um, the fact that we die even this sort of appeal to inevitability doesn't really work so we can say well all the generations of humans have died and we just got to put up with it well he says look and this is another way of nagel twisting us with these um brilliant you know thought experiments he says look what if within the process of dying, you had to be in pain for six months, intense pain just through the process of your body breaking down. Would we say, well, that's just inevitable. You just got to, you know, smile through it with a, just got to put on a grin and just sort of, you know, grit, grit your teeth and get and get through it and, you know, like, and, and just pull up your trousers. And no, we would try to, you know, we would try to medically address that or to uh, alleviate that person's suffering. So, it seems as if death could be viewed as a kind of sickness. And you can sort of see this with... Uh, people in academic areas of like bio uh, ethics who kind of see death as just sort of like a sickness, like a like entropy they sort of see as just a, a problem to be fixed. And this is very interesting. Now we're getting to topics of like, if you could live forever, would you? Immortality. These are very interesting um, questions to go with. But let's bring it back to Socrates because the question we're looking at here is, what would you be willing to die for? And if you have figured that out for yourself, then... What is it? Is it the case then that you'd be willing to actually go through with it? Because what happens to Socrates is that he gets convicted and sentenced to death, and he really has no fear about drinking the hemlock and simply going to whatever death is and going through with that process. He has no aversion to it because he's really come to the conclusion that there is nothing to fear here. There is no moral evil um, in the process of, of choosing to die because he is almost this I want to try to get to this idea but it's a very complicated idea and it's hard to express but there's almost something a little bit noble about or just this is the principle Socrates uh, is going to die for there's something um, or at least admirable about having that sort of line drawn out for himself and I think we can all sort of look at that and, and at least have a modicum of you know just sort of respect it's like that's that's interesting that someone would be that dedicated and so to bring it back to the question of death the reason why we've started here on the podcast i think this is an area of profound interest for a lot of people today particularly because of the nature of our modern information network the internet you can sort of look up anything you want and so because of that there is a emerging discussion I think in a lot of different places about what death is and and the nature of an afterlife and and what that could be and this question doesn't have an answer this is kind of the brilliant thing about um, Nagel and Socrates both trying to sort of answer this question for themselves if death is some sort of evil in and of itself it's, it's very profoundly fascinating that throughout 2,400 years of philosophy, 
uh, we still really are no more or less clear on that issue. And I think to some people that might seem depressing, but to me, I think that is very exciting. It, it's this area of human knowledge that hasn't been sort of fully decided or sorted out yet, and we can have more interesting and more deep conversations about where we're going and what death could mean. And I think this is sort of getting to the heart of what this show is going to be too. And so I think what we'll do to wrap it up, we'll bring it back to your boy, uh, Socrates. And at the end of the trial, he sort of sums up his view on the matter to the Athenian people. This is when he's convicted. He's now been sentenced to death. He has been deemed guilty for his crime of corrupting the youth. And he says to the Athenian people, okay, quote, you too must be of good hope as regards death, gentlemen of the jury, and keep this one truth in mind, that a good man cannot be harmed either in life or in death, and that his affairs are not neglected by the gods. What has happened to me now has not happened of itself, but it is clear to me that it was better for me to die now than to escape from trouble. That is why my divine sign did not oppose me at any point, so I am certainly not angry with those who convicted me, or my accusers. Of course, that was not their purpose when they accused me and convicted me, but they thought they were hurting me, and for this they deserve blame. This much I ask from them. Now the hour to part has come. I go to die. You to live. Which of us goes to the better lot is known to no one except the God. End quote. And that, ladies and gentlemen, seems like a good point to wrap it up. If you made it this far in the episode, thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to get in contact with the show and give me some thoughts or just questions, whatever, what have you, please a email socraticsmarts at gmail.com and I'd be happy to hear from you. And just that, that would be awesome because if you made it this far, I must be doing something right. So there you go. And that's it. So that's it. I'm signing off. Nomadic J, a.k.a. J. Scott Brown. This has been Socratic Smarts. We'll see you next time. Where is the point? Here is the point. Here is the point. Top of all, here we go. Down on the other side, pick up the front. And this is the annual reading of the script. Here is the point. Here is the point. I went back and I looked. What did I really see? I'm thinking about my sight and whether, whether this is quite authentic. <laughs> <laughs>